The use of private police is on the rise everywhere around the world. Police shortages, funding cuts and other things are forcing people to look for help elsewhere, simply to feel secure. Does this create a two-tier society where only the rich are protected? Whose rights are at risk? Okay, welcome to the Roundtable. I'm David Foster. Very good to have your company. It sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, you're a target of crime, but there aren't enough police around. So you go out, you hire, you pay for a private police firm. Pretty common in parts of America and in South Africa. The question is, is this a failure of the state or actually a solution to a police shortage crisis? Driving a branded car, wearing a uniform with body-mounted cameras, private police are patrolling the streets around the world. But is there a danger justice will not be done? Or is a private force the answer to a police shortage? There are more security guards in the world than police officers. In two years, the sector's worth is expected to reach $240 billion. The US-led wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have given rise to a boom in private security companies. In South Africa, the number of private security workers is almost twice the nation's combined army and police personnel. In the UK, austerity measures led to a 20% fall in police budget in real terms between 2010 and 2017, reducing the number of police to their lowest in 22 years. Security firms have moved in to meet the demand and at times are investigating crimes police are too busy to look at. In 2015, Britain had 232,000 private guards compared to 151,000 police officers. While the industry creates thousands of jobs, critics fear the rise of private policing could lead to a two-tier system where only the wealthy get protection from criminals. Research also shows demand for private guards is especially strong in developing countries, as it symbolises social status. In London, companies target affluent areas with subscription-based services, costing hundreds of pounds a month each for guards to patrol their streets. Security firm managers say they work as a visible deterrent and gather evidence. In case of any incident, they call the police. Founders of My Local Bobby say their security guards have the same powers as normal citizens, but know what they can do within the law. The Met Police has concerns over how the private sector will be held accountable, unlike police who have to be. The chairman of the Met Police Federation says, Police officers are completely transparent. They have to answer to every single action that they take, and when you have a company, because this will be a company, that comes along in this way. It is for profit. With many unable to afford private police protection, has security become a commodity? Isn't it a government's responsibility to protect its citizens? Or with many countries facing policing crises, is the private sector a necessary reality? And I'm very pleased to say that joining us for this round table, we have on Skype from Somerset, Ian Lyons, Operations Manager at Atlas Security UK at the round table with me. Rashida Sobhi, ex-police officer and privacy campaigner. We have JP Oosthuizen, Senior Lecturer in Criminology at the University of Winchester and Ken Marsh, Chairman of the Metropolitan Police Federation. Thank you all very much indeed. Ken, let me come to you first of all. I know you don't like this, but we couldn't do without them, could we? Well, in, in certain areas, I have to accept they pick up a lot of the backfall of what's happened with the reduction of the financial procurement of policing. But we've got to be very careful when you're calling bodies of people private police. They are not police in any way, shape or form. They never will be police in any way, shape or form because the role of an omnicompetent constable is defined by law and for that reason we are held to a certain level. And quite rightly, I have no issue when private companies want to come in and pick up areas, but as my colleague will probably tell you sitting on the screen over there, there has to be profit to what they do, otherwise they wouldn't be able to do it. It's as simple as that. But the fact is, if we didn't have, call them what you like, 
if we didn't have these security firms, this private police, the crime rate in this country would probably be a great deal higher. I don't agree with that, no. Um, because so we can do without them tomorrow? Well, no, I'm not saying that at all, but it's not statistically proved in any way that they pick up the backfall to reduce the crime whatsoever. Because if you see the areas that they're operating in, it's predominantly not the high crime areas that we're talking about. OK, um, Ian, I will come to you in just a moment, but JP, let me ask you this. In terms of a deterrent, if somebody sees a security officer on the street and... You know, Ken's saying, OK, it's not, it's not in the rough areas, it's in the more affluent areas that can afford them. But do you believe it actually sort of stops misbehaviour, if you like? It'll, it'll have a certain effect on low-level behaviour. So uh, high visibility policing or private security uh, police uh, um, uh, security personnel that's out in the street will have a certain will have an effect on the public trust and confidence in the system that they're providing. And that will, in affluent areas, provide a deterrent for people to be seen because they have issues of surveillance, CCTV, and, and they report those incidents to the police. But when you start dealing with a much more serious type of crime, which is burglaries, uh, sexual assaults, violent crimes, and so on, there's going to be no, no deterrent there at all because there is no support to them to do what they need to do. So they have to focus their attentions on the very minor crimes. So commercial fraud, uh, intellectual property rights and that type of stuff is the main bulk of their business at the moment. And then you go down to just the visibility patrol, which doesn't really deal with much of what the police do. They have to do a lot more than just be visible. Yeah, let me come to you. There you are. I mean, I have to say, I don't know you. You, you look quite intimidating. You're in a, a black uniform. Um, you look like quite a heavy sort of guy. In, in what sense, because an awful lot of your people are ex-policemen, in what sense do they understand that they are no longer coppers? Well, the, the, the simple line is, and I'll, I'll go with Ken there, first and foremost, we're not a police force. We are not private police. I hate that terminology and I hate that word because, as, as Ken said, we don't have the powers of a constable. We wasn't sworn in under a magistrate to give us the police powers. So therefore, we are basically a mere uniform presence. Now, we do carry body-worn cameras to gather evidence, and the, the cameras being shown, let's say, for instance, we go up and have to deal with an incident. By putting by us or our objects wearing uniform cameras, you wearing cameras on our uniform, people do actually see that, and that can actually just be a deterrent alone, because they know that they're actually being filmed. A bit like CCTV on the town centre. They don't want to be identified. Yeah, OK. Um, I was going to ask you why you carry handcuffs in that case. The handcuffs is... The problem is, is the times are changing for a police response team. Now, we live in Somerset, and it's rural policing. And it is... And we've had to look at the bigger picture now. Is just like any Joe Public can carry handcuffs, but it's about the justification of using them and applying them. Now, under Section 3 of the Criminal Law Act, it's, it, it does give a state of using reasonable force. Now, the only other time that my officers will apply handcuffs is to prevent further injury occurring to that assailant. Let's say that person has committed an arrestable offence. That person is resisting because we want him arrested for a, a, or wait for a, a constable to turn up and take that person away. OK, put... OK, I'm going to come back to you in just a minute because I know you've got loads to say. Rashida, let me ask you this. You're a police community support officer. Yes. You did quite a lot of extra work with, within the force. Where do you think it's gone wrong that people like those who are working for Ian, other people are leaving and saying the police just doesn't work anymore. We would rather work for private security. Well, it is down to, in my mm. view, the failings of this government and the, uh, uh, you know, fundamental cuts that are seeing police now leaving in, uh, you know, in scores, the morale extremely low. And, I, I'm you know, I must add that uh, the subject of private policing isn't really sending out a healthy message to a service that already is proven to have such plummeting morale because what essentially this sends out and says is that you are now replaceable. Uh, you know, any decent officer who's struggling with, with, with you know, pay cuts, would e we could easily okay. lose, lose good Can officers to go to private You're security. You're not going to change this government's policy. I'm sitting here and talking about that. So we have to accept the reality that this is with us, mm. at least for the time yes. being. And, and is it helping? It is not helping at all. Where I is think it this not is, helping? This is, you know, the, pub, the taxpayers have already paid for a public service such as policing, and they, they deserve to have a full service. And at the moment, as I see it, the Conservative Party are determined to quite simply sell off the whole of Britain. If it's not education, if it's not health or but housing... But this is not, a, this is not a political platform for you. We're talking about one specific area of, of policing.
Mm. And you think it doesn't work because... It doesn't what, work simply because I don't think that public safety or community safety in general should be up for sale. It's as simple as that. There's there's vast amount of conflict of interest involved in this particular sort of... Like, What's you know, the conflict manner. of interest? Well, say one of your subscribers, for instance, happens... You, you're investigating some sort of crime... Uh, let's say it's a homicide, but the, 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 the prime suspect turns up, turns up to be somebody you're actually, who's actually paying for your service to continue. Well, I, I, do look, I doubt very much that somebody in Ian's position would be investigating a murder, but can, can I come to JP on Absolutely. this one? Absolutely. More and more people worldwide are finding this happening in their communities, aren't yeah. they? Is it simply because of costs? No, it's not because of the cost. There's a lot of... Um, if you take the African example for, of, uh, as, a, as a prime example, South Africa. South Africa, South Africa yeah. which you mentioned. Now, South Africa, they have... For every police officer there, they have three security personnel. And they carry arms as well. They're allowed to carry weapons. But they are, they're governed by strict codes of conduct around how they can operate. But the, the reason that they've created themselves a viable, uh, productive, uh, you know, a half a billion pound uh, industry is because there's a, there's a genuine need about the levels of crime that exist. England and Wales are not at that stage yet, but it's a dangerous platform that this uh, type of debate could, it could lead to <clears throat> in the sense that we are talking about a possible second tier policing. That can't be allowed to happen because when you have a second tier policing, you are talking about countries that are destabilized, that the crime rate has gone out of control. And if you're now talking about the way the police do have the best ability to control their crime now, and even with the high crime levels that we do have, they do have things under control. They just can, can we just try and work out what you mean by two-tier policing? Do, do you mean um, one which the rich can afford, and therefore the in poor areas, rough areas, you don't get any policing of, of this type at all? Or do you mean one where you have uh, your genuine police force and then you have your private security firm? No, it's, it's two-tier on that level. This two-tier thing, which, which private policing uh, it could, in a sense, lead to if the government allow it to continue down this road and try to support, for example, legislation in private security, would be the policing for the haves and the policing for the have-nots. And so then you suddenly have, you're going back to what Sir Robert Peel in 1829 tried to stop happening was that the thief takers and the, and the Bow Street runners were servicing the rich people of London. So when he provided the police force at the time, the Metropolitan Police, it was to allow everybody access to that, to that right of policing. If you're now talking about a government looking to potentially have a, a, a larger legislative support for, for private policing, you're going back to the original concept for which the Metropolitan Police was designed to get rid of. It's a backward step. I don't disagree fully with what I'm hearing from my colleague on the screen, because I think there is a place for them. And I'll give you an example so that we can put this into some context. If we take policing, policing is policing. These people are not police, never will be police. An example I'll give you is a very good friend of mine who owns Tyler Security, which is a security <coughs> firm in London. Ex-dog handler for 36 years. That is a wealth of experience in drugs, in bombs, in everything that took place. He was the dog expert. He set up a company. Now, we used to provide, as police, for all the major football matches, Tottenham, Spurs, Arsenal, Wembley, etc., search dogs for all these. We don't because we can't afford it. He stepped in, uses ex-police officers to do exactly that work. That is absolutely great what he does. It's not police work, it's private <coughs> work for Spurs, Arsenal, Wembley, West Ham, wherever, and they are picking up the shortfall of what we can't do because we've had a billion pound cut. You've had a I billion pound in that. cuts, but let me put this other one to you as well. Part of these wounds are self-inflicted. There, there you are, and I'm, I'm, this is nothing personal. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're just over 50, you're going to retire next year. Yeah. Why doesn't the chap who's got a wealth of experience with dog handling, drugs, bombs, etc., etc., why doesn't he stay until 60 instead of leaving the force, picking up a really nice pension and going to work in the private sector for a company such as Ian's? Yeah, you, 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 you hit on something that I don't disagree with you. With you. That, that is the way it is. So you can't always now. blame the government, can no, you? No, no, no. I haven't sat here and blamed the government yeah. totally for where we are. What I do blame the government for is the fact that they have removed £1 billion from the Met budget. One we billion, you do, said, didn't you? One billion. Yeah. We can't do the same job that we did five, six years ago and expect us to still perform the same way. That's why these guys are rocking up and picking up what they're trying to do, but they are not police and never will be. And we need to get that quite clear and then we can all move forward together. Uh, Ian, let, let me come back to you. Um, uh, in response to something that uh, Rashida said here when we were talking about or, or getting involved in homicides or etc, etc and the conflict of interest, I doubt very much whether your firm would be closely involved in that, but I would like to understand what sort of work it is that you've been doing. You've been employed by one very small local council to do what? And the private council has, pay, has paid, they've paid for this themselves, haven't they? They have. Uh, that, that would be Martov, which is obviously the rural, rural town, where they've had a quite bad case of antisocial behaviour. 
Now, as as Ken said, due to due to the uh, cutback, <coughs> but that's, that the uh, police officers like used to have like, safe for neighbourhood team used to used to have local hobbies patrolling the areas. It's non-existent, and due to the due to the crime rate, whether they've had antisocial behaviour, whether they've had kids around the area, whether they've had vandalism, criminal damage, uh, possible drug taking, large nuisance calls, we, we we've been called in as as a last resort to provide a uniform presence. Now that what that means is our vehicles will turn up, all marked up, carrying body cams. And just just driving there alone, driving in the area, these people do not want to be identified. So they will actually move away from what's known as a hotspot area. And it has statistics has shown by the councillor that it has improved the quality of life due to the fact. Well, well, what sort of rumble are you dealing with out there in this little village in the west of England? Like like any other trouble in, in the local areas, but unfortunately, the rural rural policing has got quite quite offensive. It's actually got quite bad. And that will be antisocial behaviour. Now, people say, well, oh, they're only kids. They need, you know, they're letting off steam. Well, that's not the case. They're committing criminal offences. And they're upsetting local residents. The residents feel intimidated just to go out and walk to the streets. See, but this is my point I wanted to make about, about the community. So they, they're doing really good work, and I agree with them that, that, that they're, they're providing a valuable service at the moment. But the problem here is not that they should be in that position to provide that service. If the police officers and the police force, the 43 in England and Wales, had the financing that they needed to put those neighbourhood policing teams back on the streets, neighbourhood policing, which they are filling the gap for around antisocial behaviour, presence of PCSOs, presence of neighbourhood uh, officers dedicated to the area, the local bobbies that they know, are gone because they're now being used to plug those frontline policing gaps. That's the problem. So if they invested money back into the policing and stopped putting uh, you know, connections to it and, and funded those neighbourhood policing teams, that antisocial behaviour he's talking about there wouldn't exist because the bobbies would be on the street dealing with it. You, so the problem doesn't, it doesn't get solved by just saying, well, let's get these guys to fill the gap. Mm. The problem is, is there because the government not providing the funding for police forces okay, to let, let, Let's deal with the reality. Then there is no more money at the moment, or at least they're not willing to spend it. Okay, can we just right. stop at that particular yep. point? You go out and you advise either other countries or other, other police forces how best to use their resources. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say to a police force in the area where Ian works that actually it's not such a bad idea to employ somebody like that because you're not going to have the rural police force, um, uh, police officers available and therefore you can commit your officers to the front line rather than anti-social behaviour. That's the reality, isn't it? It has to happen this way. Well, it doesn't have to happen that way. I think that if you, if you look at the longer term picture, the fact is that if they get dealing with antisocial behaviour, sooner or later they're going to get involved in something that's going to be worse than antisocial behaviour. And then what happens if that company, Atlas UK, goes bankrupt tomorrow? What service are the people of the community going to get then? So there are implications to relying upon a service, which is plugging in gaps that the police are meant to do, and then, uh, then so, so what, what, what if you haven't got the money, what do you do? Well, you know, that's, the, that's another issue about, you know, vigilante type of uh, policing by local citizens to say they can take the law into their own hands. So, <coughs> again, I'm not saying that the, these type of uh, services they're providing are bad. They are essential at the moment because mm. that's what the community wants. But what you don't want is neighbourhoods seeing the visible presence of uniformed officers on the street. For example, I'm not, this is not anti actors or anything like that, but anybody other than police because they know that that police officer can deal with anything. And that's what they should be seeing, not the presence of. We're going to see a rise in policing. vigilantism. Do you think because of because of the, the gaps that are left by regular police and the fact that these security companies might just only go into affluent areas? Um, a rise in in sort of uh, uh, nuisance crimes, if you like. I agree with PJ. As long as uh, you know these cuts are, are you know persisting, uh, we will we will see uh, communities unfortunately having to pay that price. Uh, there is really no way out of this other than the actual government having to uh, front the money up. Uh, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not saying that the police are blameless in all of this. I can return to that point. But take, for instance, when I was engaging, and I was very proactive within the, uh, you know, North Kensington area, I set up a, uh, a first ever Met Police youth panel. So these are 30 young kids I took off the street for two years and kept them, steered them away from any uh, criminal activity they could have otherwise got up to in into the streets I engaged the youth into theatre I set I, I founded a festival that brought the community uh, cohesion how together. does this, um, how does this, this fit in with what we're talking about well it, it's fitting because the policing is rather complex and varies it isn't for should never be made for profit local safer neighborhood teams uh, you know did yeah. a brilliant job it's unfortunate that we see them having well let's ask you gone for now you couldn't replace uh, you know local uh, uh, policing sort of um, yeah. 
efforts, the rapport, the relationships that you build with the community is, you know, incomparable to what a private security Okay, we're all mourning offer. the past, but we have to deal with the present. So let me ask you, Ian, um, you've got 60 plus people working with you there. Um, do you see this simply as a business with a profit motive in end, or are you sort of um, altruistic about this, you and your people? Well, furthermore, as, as, as I explained before, you know, I'd rather, I'd, I'd rather see more police on, on our street, rather than, as people keep putting the terminology, as private police forces. There's no such thing, it's just a security company, face it. Secondly, you, you were saying about the... Um, what would you say? Well, David, Rashida, Rashida was suggesting that um, companies such as yours and other ones that like Ken has referenced here, uh, where his old mate's gone out with his dogs, etc., etc. This is a business, and businesses are in it for profit. And if you're in it for profit, you're not serving the best interests of the community. Right. Okay. I've got. I've got you now. Uh, that's that's not the case. Not at all. I mean, for instance, I'll give you a prime example. I had to attend Glastonbury recently with a meeting with the local resident, not the council but the local residents and shop owners. And they said that they've got a big rise in, in crime, antisocial behaviour, no-go areas. Now, this is a beautiful little town. That's very Can I stop you for just a second, Ian? Because this is not Glastonbury as the festival itself. This is Glastonbury, no, the tiny little place in, in the, the town Hills. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the town centre, which mm. has got so much history to it, the mystic and ancient. And the problem is, is the residents have come to me and said, what can we do? And the first thing I've gone to them and gave them all the option, I don't want to take their money. You, you're talking about it's a profit. I, I've told them they've got to go and speak to their local government. They've got to go and speak to their councillors, speak to the local police, see what they can do before they approach a security company. So the answer to your question is we're not in it for profit. We're there as people come to us as a last resort. You were talking about vigilante groups. You're absolutely right. I have actually had residents said to me, this i.e. being Glastonbury, saying that they've got tourists that are not attending the area because it's a no-go area. They've got people that are being mugged, people being stabbed, homeless people are taking drugs, there's no police, and the fact is that it's come to the point now that if the police don't do anything about it, or the councillors, they've actually got a group that's ready to start being vigilantes. I've told them that is the last resort they ever want to take down there because they will, in fact, themselves. Okay, well, if you, if you know Glastonbury, and I've been down there um, quite a few times, not just for the festival. I mean, you know, it's, it's a place with mystic shops, it's, it's full of charm, it, it doesn't sort of ooze threatening behaviour. Pretty pass we've come to, really, isn't it? Mm. It's unfortunate. Um, and as you said, you know, if the government's not going to provide any more money, what, what do the police do? And I, I feel really sorry for the local police in the areas where I used to, when I was an ex-police officer, I used to work a lot with neighbour policing for many years. And we developed very strong relationships that my colleagues now can't keep anymore because they're not allowed to work in those areas because they need it elsewhere. And then companies like Atlas have to step in. And, and the thing is that Atlas and the, and the people that they have aren't being paid oftentimes the amount of money they should be paid and they have to deal with a lot of stuff that escalates very quickly and put themselves at harm and I don't think it's fair it's but but unfortunately that's you know that, that's where they're on that what that's what they have to do Ken you're retiring next year I am are yeah. you going to go and work for a private security I'm firm? not no that's the last thing I would ever consider doing not because I have anything against private security firms but I've done 30 years as a police officer and I have no intention of carrying on in that field but I I, 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 I I'm, in, I'm intrigued by what we're talking about yeah. today because there are there are all different different components to where this is leading us and and the bottom line is We've had massive cuts. That's a give me. We all accept that. We've got to move on. As you've quite rightly said, we're not going to get any more at the moment. So when you look at the areas that these companies are picking up as security firms, there is a need for them or they wouldn't be doing it. So I can't sit here and just say, what a load of rubbish, we don't need them, because there is a need for them. If, if your young man here has got 60 people out there working, there is clearly a need. But what I don't want to ever see is the denigration of the role of the Omni Compton Constable, because that is the backbone of society. That's what the public... I love trusts. that expression. It's like, uh, presumably it's current in the police force. I've never heard it before. An Omni Competent Constable. It's wonderful. Exactly. And the reason we say that is because a constable, everyone is a constable, every, whatever rank you are. And we have to carry something like thousand skills to do what we do. And we're answerable to every single one of those. We don't always get it right. And I wouldn't sit here and be pompous and say that we do. But the transparency is there and you know what you're getting 
from your local Bobby, your local police officer. And I'm very concerned when I look at a lot of these, not Ian's, because he looks very smart and very good at what he's doing, but a lot of these companies that are out there are for profit and I'm dubious as to what they're delivering. So we need to just, you know, we need to keep them completely separate from police, and I think Ian would agree with that, and move forward. I don't know, you meet Ian 12 o'clock on a dark night in Glastonbury and he's telling you to behave. I think you probably would. I've met a lot worse. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me, the coughing, everything. Thank you all very much indeed. Ian, good luck with your work. Rashida, thank, thank, you, for, thank you for coming in. Every single one of the panel, bar myself, has some association with the police forces and uh, would wish, I would think, that things were perhaps as they were 20, 25 years ago with the investment and with the authority and with the respect that the police has had. But times they have been the changing and that's what we've been talking about here on Roundtable. I'm David Foster from my guests. Thank you very much for watching. We hope to have your company next time. Bye-bye.